rigorous research is the key to academic excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, with this quote, let's start with the final session of an incredible day, Masterclass 1 on interdisciplinary, integrative, and translational research and linking clinical and field practice with research. In this session, we will look into translational research that takes scientific discoveries made in the laboratory or out in the clinic and transforms them into new treatments and approaches to medical care that improves the population's health. With this, I welcome all the dignitaries and request Dr. Sanjay Pujari, sir, Director and Chief Consultant of the Institute of Infectious Diseases, Pune, to kindly accompany our eminent speakers onto the stage. Dr. Suman Rao, ma'am, WHO Consultant and Professor, Department of Neonatology, St. John Medical College. <laughs> Dr. Sanjay Gupte, sir, Ex-President, Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecological Societies of India. <laughs> Dr. Shailesh Punitambeka, sir, internationally acclaimed laparoscopic surgeon and medical director, Galaxy K Hospitals, Pune. <laughs> and Dr. Arun Kinare, sir, honorary professor of radiology, Bharati Hospitals, Pune. Thank you, sir. Yeah, good evening, uh, everybody. At the outset, let me thank uh, Sim Research for organizing this uh, interesting uh, panel discussion. Uh, right now, we have here a galaxy of stars. Amongst themselves, we are looking at 1,000 publications together. So this is a classic uh, panel uh, panelist group, which can give you a, a lot of insights into how research is conducted during routine clinical practice. I'll briefly introduce each of them. And uh, first, Dr. Suman Rao is a neonatologist from uh, St. John's, uh, Bangalore. She has 22 years of experience in academics and research. She is a consultant at the Department of Ministry of Corporate Affairs at the World Health Organization. And she has 110 publications, presented more than 140 papers and more than uh, 300 lectures in uh, conferences and uh, CMAs. It's a pleasure to have you, ma'am, uh, here. <laughs> Next is uh, our teacher, actually, Dr. Sanjay Gupte. He is a well-known gynecologist uh, practicing in Pune for around 40 years. He is uh, President uh, Foxy 2010, President uh, DIPSI 2013, he is the chairman of the Technical Research Committee of the Indian uh, Council of Medical Research and an ex-honorary professor and postgraduate teacher in obstetrics and gynecology. He has authored eight books and chapters uh, in more than 50 books and more than 150 publications to his credit. So welcome, sir. <laughs> Next is my old friend uh, Shailesh Puntambekar. He is a very dynamic, globally renowned laparoscopic surgeon. He is a director and consultant laparoscopic oncosurgeon at Galaxy Care uh, Hospitals. Uh, he is the winner of the Golden Telescope Award uh, and the Kurt Sam Best Video Award at the American Association of Gynecologist uh, Laparoscopic Set on, uh, during various years. He is the only Indian to be the board member at the AAGL Oncology Committee. And he has 300 publications, 150 paper presentations, more than 1,000 lectures in conferences and CMEs. So it's a pleasure to have Shailesh. And then we have Dr. Arun Kindre. He's a, a radio diagnosis a expert, 42 years of experience. He's a consultant ultrasonology a sonologist at KM Hospital and Diabetes Research Center. He's a consultant ultrasonologist at Jahangir Hospital. And uh, uh, he has 110 publications and uh, national publications and 10 international. Sir, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. So let me start by asking uh, each of you to briefly tell us about what is your subject area of interest in research and 
how has your research contributed to furthering of science in your particular subject area? So good evening and uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, it is rare that we get to stay, uh, share the stage across specialities. So it's really a nice uh, feeling to be here. And um, um, I've been a neonatologist for the past 22 years and I primarily think of myself as a clinician and research is on the side. Um, but I think research takes a big role, especially when you're a teacher. So my research experience, I would say, started actually with my DM neonatology in KM Mumbai, where I was thrust upon a thesis topic. It was on something called as kangaroo mother care. I don't know whether any of you all are familiar with this. Uh, this is, a, I would say, a game changer as far as newborn preterm survival is concerned, which improves mortality by a whopping 40%. And that was a randomized control trial I did, it, I did as a thesis. And when you join a super speciality like DM, you want to do something high five. You want to do work with ventilators, you want to, you know, some, something really um, technical. And, and I was given this thesis where the only thing was to put the baby in skin-to-skin -skin contact with the mother. So I must say I was disappointed. But then, you know, like a very good student, I did my thesis well, and I really thank my teacher, Dr. Rekha Udani, for this, because that has been, um, I would say, a, a life changer for me, because it has taken me across, say, Mumbai, Bangalore, and now I'm a consultant with the WHO, primarily because of my work with Kangaroo Mother Care. So though the first lesson I want to share with you all is, even if you're not interested and you're doing something, get interested in what you do and that has been my I have I have done that and taken forward kangaroo mother care once I completed DM went to St. John's where I've been working with I have taken it forward did small small research as part of fellowship theses and theses of students but uh, these small things and we used to do randomized control trials with this and I used to wonder why doesn't our RCTs get published in you know Lancet and NEJM and then you see something hi-fi. And only when I started working with WHO, and it started with as a principal investigator in an implementation research in, in, in the field, public health in Koppal district in Karnataka. And there, the current new um, director general of ICMR, Dr. Rajiv Bell, he, he was the WHO newborn person, and he was in he, he was, uh, I would say, maybe impressed with my work in KMC. And at the same time, a new large trial was going on, that is the immediate kangaroo mother care trial, where even unstable, small, sick babies who couldn't breathe, we said, let's put the baby back with the mother. So going back to nature, kind of. And this, has, this was the work he, he got me into um, as a consultant for, and uh, I have been associated with it. And, and that is when I understood the rigor with which a very good trial works. And that has got published in NEJM last year. And for me, that would be the high point of my uh, research where I'm the corresponding author for that. And I think I have come a long way from my small thesis, fellowships, uh, studies, to something which is multi-country, where the rigor of monitoring, the rigor of um, adherence to protocol, and um, assessment of outcomes is what I have learned from that. And that's something I'm sharing with my students also. Um, in addition to continuing to contribute globally through WHO for the different trials. Thank you. Before I start, I would like to, like, to know the audience, first of all. You know, so tell me how, how, which branch you are from. Can you say, are, are there medical students here? Or how many are medical students? None of the, then you are the hospitality students or what, what are your branches? Pardon me? Masters in public health. Great, wonderful. All of you? You are from? Nutritional lab. Great, wonderful. And any others? Oh, okay, great, okay, all right. So, all together, wonderful, fine. So, you know, as you know, Professor Suman told, told you just now, the teachers play a great role, you know, in your career. And same 
with me, you know, as a first year house surgeon, my teacher, one legendary doctor, Anjanelu, you know, he was a doyen in uh, gynecology at that time. And he insisted that, you know, I do some research and paper and that in the first year itself, you know, I was meant to do some research and, you know, write a paper and present the paper. It appeared to be a terrible task at that time because, you know, as, as you know, first year students, you have to a lot of other work and all that. And uh, But that triggered off, you know, again, you know, my interest in, uh, you know, going in for research. Then the very first paper, because I think the, my teacher was there that got a first prize in our national conference. And that again motivated me and then I did, you know, many more papers before even finishing my uh, you know, post-graduation. And later on, after going in the practice, obviously what happens, you are busy with your own uh, things, your patients and everything. So research always takes a backseat. But then you also start looking at different issues in a different way and then you, a lot of problems that you come across. And then so first, you know, as, and that is from your field, you know, at that time, only in KM Hospital, the neonatal, first neonatology unit was there. And obviously, my small hospital did not have it. And I delivered a premature, uh, you know, twin babies. And we had to shift to uh, the KM Hospital. And a BCOM person, and this is important for all the branches, you know, who was the brother of that patient, you know, saw that what was happening in KM. And he said that, you know, transporting the babies to the hospital was a problem at that time. So he said, why not to we together work? And that was his idea. And that's why we worked on, you know, incubators, um, Indian made, starting from thermocol and all that. And, you know, we created the incubators with German collaboration. You, you won't believe now, he, he himself is an MNC now. You know, Shriya's enterprises, he provides to many, many hospitals across the world. So. Whatever branch you are in, if you look at it and, you know, point of research or doing something translational, that can take you, you know, places, absolutely. So, you know, that, that's important. And then after that, you know, there were other issues. We used to have other uh, problems like, uh, you know, the women bleeding, uh, you know, heavy menstrual bleeding and all that. There was an instrument which was by, you know, one of the American uh, uh, giants, and it used to cost very heavily, like 25 lakhs of rupees. So we said, Ki, why not, you know, this doesn't appear to be very difficult and why not try and convert it into, you know, Indian, this thing. So we got an Indian thermoablator and that the machine itself was, co co you know, costing only 1.5 lakhs. And the reusable, which the Johnson & Johnson reusable used to be, you know, something like 25,000 we made it in 500 rupees. And you know, and the tra whole treatment scenario for abnormal uterine bleeding uh, could be changed and uh, the hysterectomies could be reduced at that time. Well, after that, interestingly, you know, I was associated with uh, symbiosis itself. The new law, Consumer Protection Act, you are all now well versed with, that came in. All the doctors were worried, so I decided to do my you know, learn more about the law and did my LLB also, as when I was in practice. And with symbiosis itself, we started the first, you heard the PGDMLS course in law. You know, it still exists here in PG. So we started that with uh, symbiosis and then uh, did, you know, some, a lot of work in, uh, you know, ethics and uh, legal issues. We realized at that time that there are no guidelines, Indian guidelines for practice and we need to have that, if we have to argue in the court of law, then we have to tell the court that, that we are doing things as per the guidelines and that's why you can't hold us negligence. And that's why we worked in this field and started working in ethics and then I was able to work uh, in ethics with Maharashtra Medical Council and um, uh, our Medical Council of India uh, also uh, in ethics um, committee. Well, that was some time back. And lately, again, coming back to the practice, one realizes after the years of practice that there are some issues that though we treat the patients, you know, we know, do the diagnosis, treat the patients, we, but we do not know the root cause of a disease. 
you know, that you will find in many, many diseases. We still, except for infections, we hardly know the root cause of the disease, right? From, you know, cardiac problems to why it occurred and, and this is for public health people, that's very important. And that has lately brought me into what is called as genomics or, you know, genetic sciences. Because all this is related to genomics. If we do our, everybody's, you know, the, what is called as a DNA study or exome study, we'll find that there are some variants in all of us which lead us to these particular, uh, you know, diseases. And that's why now we have a, a full-fledged genomic research lab. Oh, we are working in city of Pune. And I'm sure some of the students who are in nutrigenomics might have visited because there's a course with symbiosis and uh, nutrition department and hands-on training in, uh, you know, genetics. Um, uh, in that uh, lab and we are collaborating uh, with symbiosis also. So this is all the spectrum that you know I've worked with and what I believe always is whatever you do should be helpful to somebody you know in, uh, not only as treatment but whatever research we do should be helpful to tr change the treatment for the patients and that's where translational research is very important because we have silos, you know, researchers working in the research field and clinicians just doing their own things. It's great that conference like this brings everybody together and that's the great work that CM Health is, you know, uh, doing and I think everybody will learn from each other a lot through such conferences. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, good evening everybody. It's a uh, first of all honor. Uh, that uh, Sanjay, a very close friend of mine, is actually chairing the entire session because I have seen his work uh, go a long way uh, from a simple resident to a world-class uh, recognized scientist. It gives a pleasure to see your colleague going so high in life. And I'm really proud of you, Sanjay, and through being at le that level. Anyway, I think uh, I come from a surgical branch, and as you are aware, that uh, as a surgeon, the basic idea of any surgeon is to strive hard to do more and more and more surgeries. So my journey has been when I started in BJ Medical College, the only thing that I knew about research was to write my thesis, which was 90% of the time copied from somebody else's thesis. So that legacy continued. And this was one of the things that I understood, that it is so easy to do around. As I entered Tata Memorial Hospital, the idea was to get more and more surgeries. And I have some seen some fantastic surgeons in Tata Memorial Hospital. My journey into research actually started when I passed out of Tata Hospital and came back to Pune. And then, till that time, I had no research paper. Because my entire dream was to do become a good surgeon, doing the surgeries more and more. But when I started traveling abroad for the conferences, I realized that XYZ boss of mine, a fantastic surgeon, but not known anywhere. And my bosses used to always say, only I can do the surgery. And I used to always dream, when will I do this surgery? At what age will I do this surgery? Is there a technique that he is doing wonderfully documented? And the biggest eye-opener was when one of the top cancer surgeons of India was invited in the United States. And he spoke about a procedure called esophagectomy. And he said, I have done 5,000 esophagectomies. These are my results and I know this thing. Everybody thought he will get a complete thundering applause at the end of the day. One scientist, one surgeon from America got up and said, Yes, doctor, your technique is great, everything is superb, but do you have a citation? Have you published? Killed in one sentence. No publication. Numbers don't matter. Concepts matter, number one. Second thing, whatever you do, if you do not document, world is not going to believe. Now, especially in your era, when in WhatsApp and this era, if you do not document the things and if you do not write what you want to do, it is a bad thing to happen. And that's why I came back as a change person and decided to write what, whatever I did. The worst experience I got was the initial time when I started writing for international journals is the editor's comment, your English is bad. Well, I am not trained in English, so my mother tongue is not English. So my first publication that is now recognized worldwide, the anatomical publication, went into fat belongs to rectum is the technique that we developed for anatomy. And they said, this is bad English, we'll put it in apostrophe. But they published it anyway. 
So we get some nasty comments from the editors, but that is between you and the editors, doesn't matter. And therefore, I, we started publishing. Whatever I did, good or bad, we started publishing. We started publishing our complications. We started publishing our technique. We started publishing our results of doing any kind of thing because we started robotic, laparoscopy, cancer, everything differently. And the world recognized only because they don't understand how many surgeries you have done. They recognize whether whatever you have done has been analyzed by an independent three reviewers and they have seen and reviewed your article and say that it is good. So this was the thing and then it inculcated into various areas. I started less fear for publishing because the editors when they were giving nasty comments, like Madam said, I always thought because I am Indian, my article is getting rejected. And if I was white, then I, my article would have been better. But that is not the truth. The truth is you have to learn to write a paper in the correct way. You have to learn to write your article in a correct way. And that, of course, when Sanjay discusses, he'll tell you. But a lot of people, if I ask any one of you to write a paper, where will you start? What will you start with? You will start with introduction. What will you start with? Abstract. How will the abstract come? Research questions. So what should be your first thing that you should write? Every person who works with me, if I tell him to write a paper, starts with introduction. That's the worst thing to do. You have to first write your results. Out of the results that you see, you make a one observation that this is what is there. So unless you know what your results are and you then do an hypothesis, based on that hypothesis that these many patients are surviving for so many years, and based on that, the introduction and the discussion is written. So first, in any surgical or medical paper is the results. It's not with a preconceived idea. So this is how paper writing, which is not our culture, was started. When we were medical students, the papers were not given importance. I think now, Sanjay, every professor has to write two papers, otherwise they don't get promotion. But the MCI, the Medical Council of India, only awakened in 1992. Till that time, by your seniority from lecturer, you went to associate professor. From associate professor, you went to professor. Medical college, unless you have two papers, which is now the rule, you cannot appear. But there was a late awakening in our country. But my clinical and everything, and a humble request to all of you is, which is my favorite thing which I teach my residents. My residents hate me if I tell them to write papers. They feel they have come here to learn surgery. What is this boss doing? But once they publish and when they go abroad or they apply for any kind of corporate or medical colleges, it is their publication which takes them inside. And therefore, publish or perish is my terminology which I teach them. Either you publish or you perish. And the entire idea of doing your publication is because unless you document so many people in the world had fantastic ideas, but because of no documentation, no urge to write what they were writing, we have lost fantastic ideas in the field that I am in, in surgery. I still feel we are the best surgeons in the world, unfortunately with very few publications. Only 1% of the surgical publication in the world are from the surgical field. It is a pathetic thing of our country. I don't know when things will change around, but if at all I can give you one point inspiration today, that it is all about publication which will help you to grow, not these YouTubes, not this WhatsApp. Don't join these WhatsApp universities and YouTube universities. Join into a correct research and you will become very, very good in this. And once this culture comes, this culture will get passed on to this. So the idea of this entire, I think, conference is to inspire you. Rest 99% is your perspiration. And that is the road to success. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I totally agree with Shailesh. You may have a very palatial house, you may have a BMW, a Mercedes, a lot of money. But remember, your best currency is your publication. One has to respect research, and research has to be an integral part of your life. I remember my days. I started my practice in Pune in the year 1984. Before that, I was working in the Middle East, and that was my Second year in Middle East, 
where it was a healthy population, no question of seeing many abnormalities in a human being. Mind, mind you that we used to get camels also because it's illiterate people. They said for them, doctor is doctor. I mean, doctor could examine a human being, you could examine a camel also. They would bring a camel to the consulting room. It so happened, the only abnormality in the Middle East, which was the commonest, was kidney stones and a condition called bilharziasis. This is a disease from Egypt. There were hundreds of publications uh, about bilharziasis, and they were all retrospective studies. There were surgical, uh, sur surgical opinions, uh, surgical techniques described signs, symptoms, and all the aspects, except, except nobody had ever done a dynamic study in this particular condition. Dynamic study means it's a real-time study observing the motility of the urine as it passes from the kidney to the urinary bladder. And I thought that this was a good subject to study. And in the second year of my stay in Middle East, we started uh, a project on this. We completed it in about two years' time and sent it to the British Journal of Urology, and luckily it got accepted. So that was our first publication, and after that there was a lull. Nothing happened till 84. I forgot about research. I came to India, started my practice, and I was the only one who was practicing ultrasonography in the district, in the whole district of Pune. Population is no problem in India, as you know, but the advantage was that I got so many patients, and because there were so many patients, there were so many conditions I used to see. And then, in the first three to four years' time, I noticed that there are so many abnormal conditions or diseases I see, which are seen very frequently, contrary to the incidents reported in the international literature. So I thought that, and to give you a concrete example, this was about stones in pancreas. Pancreas is a gland in the body. And these stones, in the international literature, the incidence was hardly 1 to 2 percent, whereas here I would see 2 to 3 cases every month. That was a really high incidence. So I thought I should look into more details, and that's how my first research started about the pancreas. Then there were so many other things. I noticed that the morphology of the organs in our population was different. Simplest example is that of a baby in mother's womb. The baby, though the anatomy, the structure looks same, the morphology doesn't. The babies are small, yet normal. So that was the breakthrough. And that research is still going on. We are now studying the third generation. Probably that's the largest longitudinal study in the world. We studied the girls who were about to get married, so in the preconception stage, then after they got married, they became pregnant, so we studied their pregnancies. They delivered babies. So we studied the daughters till they became mothers. They delivered, now we are studying their daughters. So it's a very, very large study still going on. It started in 94. So many publications have come out. So that was a major study. Then it so happened, I used to be a frequent visitor to Japan because uh, the equipment I used uh, in my clinic was a Japanese equipment, and so I had to go to Japan three, four times for conferences. Once or twice, the company called me for some inputs because probably I was the one who introduced this, this particular equipment in India. In the year 93, 94, I bought a special equipment uh, for the diagnosis of prostate cancer and uh, rectal abnormalities. Now, this probe was very expensive. Those days, uh, on an average, the machine would cost about three to four lakhs. Now, this particular part of the equipment cost me five lakhs, very expensive. In six weeks' time, I called the engineer. I said, I'm not happy with this instrument. There's a manufacturing fault. I was too junior to say so. And probably they took it lightly. I kept on pestering them about this. And then, one day they said, I got a mail from Japan, and they asked for uh, some pictures on the probe. So I sent them the pictures, and I said, there is a definitely a manufacturing fault. In four to five days' time, I got a reply from Japan, sir, you are absolutely right. 
we take the probe back and we stop manufacturing the probe. So this was a different field. But what happened? What was the result? I complained about this instrument. Then the company came out with another special instrument for the diagnosis of breast cancer. So what they did, they sent some four or five probes to different countries in the world. But the first probe they sent to me to work on it for a period of one and a half year. And they sent their engineer who was based in Chennai and would make a visit to Pune every week. So I used that equipment for one and a half year, submitted the report, and uh, then the publication came out. So that was very interesting. Then I started, I joined the research department in KM Hospital where Dr. Yajnik, he headed the department of diabetes and uh, we had a very big, uh, well-respected diabetes uh, research center. After joining, I mean, I worked with him, but I was also a consultant in the department of ultrasound. While uh, working there, I came across some congenital abnormalities of a blood vessel in a baby. And then I searched the literature, there were many references which specified the abnormalities in the baby associated with this particular abnormal course of a blood vessel. All the abnormalities dealt with baby's heart, baby's bones, baby's kidneys, but we found three to four abnormalities in the brain. And they were never reported in the literature, so we sent a paper to the American Journal, it got accepted. And Dr. Uh, Philip Genty, who was the pioneer in this field, he himself wrote to us. He sent a personal mail to me and congratulated and said, you are the first one in the world to report these abnormalities in the brain. And that was great encouragement. And so that is how the research got off. Then we were so, we became very enthusiastic. In the next three months, we published another paper which got rejected, rightly, because that was, we did it in a, very, in, in a hurry. You have to be very particular about the quality control. And I think we lack on that particular front. So when you do research, there are so many uh, things which need to be addressed properly. There is various aspects, the training, the quality control, the analysis. So we'll come to it as the session goes on. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Sarjan, before, uh, Sanjay, before we go on, I think you have done wonderful work and that's also in a field of, you know, HIV. And you started when actually people were scared of HIV because there was no treatment. Even doctors used to refuse to uh, see patients at that time. So your story must be really fascinating. So why don't you tell, you know, your story Sir, first? Sir, uh, we have very restricted time. No, it doesn't matter, but I think that, you know, that's going to be very interesting. Okay, so to just briefly tell you is uh, uh, my involvement started when I, in a second year MBBS, AIDS was just coming up in 1989. Nobody was willing to talk about AIDS. It was a sexual taboo. So this is like a group of students, all of us second year medical formed an NGO and we started doing uh, mass awareness campaigns for the population. But then we were not sure that whether what we are telling or whatever communications we are doing, whether we are reaching the population. So the first study we did was in 1992, that was a before after study with a questionnaire, after an intervention to try to find out whether our poster exhibition is improving the knowledge of these people. This we sent it, at that time I remember 1992, that paper abstract we sent it to the International AIDS Conference in Amsterdam. And I was still uh, intern. It got accepted for poster presentation. And then I went there uh, when my father took out a loan for the air travel ticket. But why is it important to tell you is when you go to Amsterdam and when you see that field moving there, the researchers there, that's an extremely great exposure. So I think as uh, Shailesh mentioned international exposure is where you open your eyes, really, of what we are, what we do here, and what is being done internationally in the field of uh, research. Then when I finished my uh, MD, I decided to pursue in HIV. Remember, many of my seniors and my teachers dissuaded me from going into HIV field. But I started practicing, then I 
One of, how, how do you identify research question is that we didn't have CD4 counts at that time. The machine was expensive, the cost was uh, very prohibitive for patients. So we wanted to find out whether we can have an alternative way of measuring or correlating CD4 count. So what we did was we did hemograms of patients and we also did CD4 counts and we tried to correlate the total lymphocyte count which can be calculated from the hemogram with the CD4 count. At the clinic, real time, I was entering hemogram data along with the CD4 data in an Excel sheet while I was seeing patients. We didn't have, so I had just started practice, so we didn't have resources to recruit somebody to do data entry. And I think I had collected data for about 450 patients. And then we showed that total lymphocyte count. Less than 1,200 was predictive of a CD4 count of less than 200. I sent it as an abstract to international conference in Geneva. It got accepted in poster. And then I went there on a scholarship. So that this time there was no loan required <laughs> for going. So this builds up. In 2001, then subsequently, people start realizing you're around in this field. There are people who approach you for international collaborations. But the most important thing that happened in my career was in 1998, I got a three-month exposure to epidemiology and biostatistics at the Johns Hopkins on a scholarship. So I, there I was completely involved with studying epidemiology and biostatistics. And I think that is where it all changed. The perception about looking at clinical practice, medicine, apart from forget about doing research. I mean, if you have that perspective, you can do an evidence-based research. And then it just networking and, you know, publications. Now I'm reviewing uh, for numerous journals. I am on uh, editorial board of some journals. So I can tell you what keeps us on is it's intoxicating. To be very crude, both nashila cheese. So you have to be intoxicated. I mean, it's very mysterious. It gives you a kick. And this is what keeps us. This is what is true about perhaps everything in life. But let me finish my story. And I mean, what very important things I, I, I made notes here are very critical for young people to understand. One is focus on a subject. So focus on your interest and pursue that interest. Be an expert to the core in that area. Pursue research, study, so very important is to focus on that. I mean, we saw, especially amongst these uh, panelists, that each of them has a very specific area of interest. Second, we already talked about international exposure. If you get a chance, get an international exposure, both in terms of trying to get uh, training in epidemiology, research design, methodology, biostatistics, etc. Now I can tell you there are online courses which are available very cheaply, which are from Harvard, which are from Stanford. These are available, you can just write it down on Coursera, Coursera, C-O-U-R-S-E-R-A, you can Google it. Here you can use uh, internet, Shailesh, <laughs> to, to improve your, so, so please go do online coursing, courses, uh, it's very, very important. Third is how these guys, or maybe even me, got into research because there was some need in practice. We identified that need. There was perhaps a need of using and developing an incubator. There was a perhaps a need for developing a new surgical technique. There was perhaps a need for developing a new instrument to, or a probe. So this need for practice, identifying it by an astute observation, and persevering to try to address that need. Because many people understand that, you know, there is a need, but not everybody pursues it. So this is a different blood here, which tries to pursue it and try to develop a solution for it. So be perseverant. That's very, very important, right from, uh, from the initial phases. The other thing Shailesh mentioned very clearly is document, document, document. Unless you document, you are not able to develop any uh, research questions, analyze data, and publish. So you will perish if you don't publish. In India, we don't perish if we don't publish. 
because we do clinical practice and we are perhaps earning more money in clinical practice rather than doing research. So in India, it doesn't really true that you publish or in fact, it's very difficult in India to get funding. We'll talk about it for research. So clinical practice pays you more definitely in India. So it's not necessarily perishing, but perishing with a different currency, perishing with, you know, perhaps not having that uh, intoxicating feeling. <laughs> so you don't get that through research. I mean, that is somewhere it may be. The other thing I thought was very, very important was not getting dejected with rejection. It's a very important quality of a researcher. Whether you get dejected because you didn't get funding, whether you get dejected because your paper didn't get accepted. For me, getting a paper across is the most amazing experience. If it gets rejected, I'll be very happy to see the comments of the reviewers. And if it is amenable to repair, I'll use those comments to modify my paper and submit to another journal. So you can always use these uh, things to, uh, to uh, improve. So don't get dejected with rejections. And finally, I think uh, Shailesh mentioned that, you know, it's the results which are important. I would little differ from the medical field here. The first and most important thing is the methods. If you have wrong methods, you're going to have wrong results in medical research. But in your surgical, your results are very important. I mean, I was thinking about it when you mentioned it. So perhaps that doesn't apply to your field. But in our field, if you don't have good methods, you will have wrong results. If you don't have good data collected, there is a very beautiful uh, statement in biostatistics textbook. It says, uh, garbage in, garbage out. So if you put in garbage, you will always get results which are garbage out. That is particularly for a bit. So what I would like to ask maybe any one of you or all of you is, how important do you think is a training in research methodology? Partial training or, you know, and understanding of biostatistics necessary to do research. I totally agree with you, and I was thinking when Dr. Shailesh said about uh, even we would start with methods. And to write your research question, first of all, and then to develop a methodology around it, you definitely need to know at least the ABC of uh, research methodology and statistics. Like they say, no statistician will be able to redo your paper if you go to him the last minute. And you need to involve them, or now better still, you learn the basics and then start your research. In fact, in our medical college, we have a research methodology course uh, for our undergraduates. I think one of you all talked about Dr. Um, uh, Salim Yusuf, who is an alumni of St. John's. He started a mentorship program for undergrads. And Initially, we would take only 10 students from each, uh, from the first year to participate, and they had to write an exam and come in. And they would do a small research along with learning about research methodology. But now we found that it, it is so much in demand that we have started this as something that we offer to all. It's not compulsory, but we offer to all, and understanding that is absolutely necessary for us to do a decent quality research. And at this stage, I would also like to say one more issue is about publications. Um, you don't perish, but in a medical school for your promotions, you need it now. And therefore, I would, I would really caution people about publication. That shouldn't be your goal. I feel our goal should be still to do good research. And if you do good research or any research, it's a crime not to publish. But we should not say, I will do research because I want a publication. And that is sort of having a real uh, bad um, elements into this, where people are saying, uh, Madam, I want to do research with you. I said, what's your goal? I want a publication so that I can go abroad. So I think that's something I would really dissuade students from looking at research for, as a, from the end user, end point of view. 
do research for the passion of it, and at the end, when you get your publication out of it, yes, indeed, it is intoxicating, and that's something, you know, that is the eureka time where, yeah, my first publication is out. Thank you. So it's like, uh, enjoy the process rather than the outcome. It's said in the Gita, right? Yeah, I uh, just uh, rejoined her. There is a difference between medical and surgical publication. So surgical publications are divided into three parts. Part number one is publications on the uh, technique of surgery. So technical details, you cannot have methods and methodology first. So technical details is number one. Number two, I work in cancer. I am as a cancer surgeon. So number two is your DFS and OS, that is disease-free survival and overall survival. So if you plan your such way in methods and materiology and then you only select only inclusion criteria that only I'll include this, I'll only include T1 patients and I will not include T3 patients, then you will never have this kind of a data. So results are very important for, because finally it is about the end point which is the uh, survival. Any kind of publication that you do in cancer is all about survival. And the third and the most important thing that we have to always worry about which very few people talk, and this is my biggest problem, whenever, even in medical oncology, is very few people publish negative publications. And I hate this when everybody, so I had to literally fight with editors to have my publications, negative publication. My first negative publication was laparoscopy has increased the incidence of ureteric fistulas. We did the first ureteric reimplantation of the world laparoscopically, but I said that out of the first 10 radical hysterectomies that I have done, laparoscopically, I had five fistulas and I was open about it. When in 500 that I had done open, I had no fistulas. So get that publication is very bad. So I feel there are three things which are there. Now there is a LACC trial, that is the trial which says that cancer cervix cannot be operated laparoscopically. It is an RCT, randomized control trial, level 1 evidence. Unfortunately, 34 centers which were accrued are only America and Latin America. The disease comes from India. The disease comes from South Africa. Who are these whites to teach us? So I have written an article and which says that this is a wrong technique that they followed. They rejected it last week. I fought with them that why are you not focusing? And they rejected on some trivial issues, bad technique, you have not written about long-term complications of radiations. You have not written about what happened to the patients who with sexual thing written about this. What was your urinary complication? I said, mind you, editor, the focus is that we didn't have recurrence as compared to what is there. And you are focusing something on it. We fought it and just today we received the message that please send the paper back and we'll send it to three other reviewers. So to get a negative publication, Sanjay, is the worst thing in the literature. The entire editors are guided by what the industry wants. You cannot write anything against laparoscopy. You cannot write anything against good drug. Very difficult to get it publication. So publication is not something that you will give a good this thing. Sometimes the rejection is purely because it is against the standard norm and it is controlled by the industry. And that's where my problem lies at majority of the times. Just to give you a rejoinder again, is that most of the times what happens is if it's a pharma industry sponsored study and if it is a negative result, the pharma industry doesn't submit it to a journal for review itself. So it's not about the editors. But look at the COVID pandemic. The COVID pandemic started with hydroxychloroquine, ivermectin, azithromycin and so many things. And then subsequently there were all randomized control negative trials which showed azithromycin doesn't work, chloroquine, which were all published. Uh, I mean, we'll talk about it maybe if we have later on time, but let's continue with the... Yeah, you said about the training part of a uh, uh, research project. I think uh, it's a very essential component that each and every person getting involved in the team has to have a proper training in that particular subject. Apart from that, one needs to define this topic when you think of writing or to think of uh, <coughs> studying a particular project. Power calculation is also very important. You have to have the sample size. You have to know what population you are going to deal with. 
you may do a research which may not be of any use to that population or secondly you may uh, think of doing a research which may not be possible in that particular population you also have to decide whether you want to do a longitudinal study or a cross sectional study and both are totally different i mean one is time consuming more expensive in other you can have shortcuts on the financial aspects cross sectional studies are much cheaper you don't require much manpower on the contrary for a longitudinal study you require a lot of people the infrastructure has to be there and a meticulous quality control is a basic basic essential thing in a research project well you know uh, when we are talking of all this i don't want you all to get dissuaded ki oh this appears something very difficult you know i can't do that you know research and all that there is now something coming up and you will agree that was what you did for, as your first paper and that is the real world experience and what do we mean by real world experience you know many times especially in clinical practice in you know private situations is impossible to do you know this uh, rcts double blind studies how can you tell the patient that you know i am going to not treat you with the, maybe i'll treat you with placebo and the other person a medicine and then we'll find out this can't happen in a private practice you know nobody is going to agree to that so whatever you do you can document that is important as they say and that becomes your real life experience and sometimes the real life experience also goes a long way in bringing out issues which will really help in trans you know transforming the treatment so because otherwise you know i'm looking at everybody's faces they are you know wondering you, well they're talking of something impossible to do you know <laughs> so it's not so whatever you do just document it whatever you observe whatever as sanjay did as his first paper his posters he just saw what was the effect of those posters you know on paper and got a questionnaire and did that so th th that that is real world experience which m mattered a lot so i think that is also important maybe i would just add on i mean as a word of encouragement like you said sir if not you at least your teacher should have a good knowledge of research methodology and we find that that itself is challenging in the medical field because i know our generation of uh, 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 teachers did not undergo rigorous research methodology course during their training we had one chapter in park and park and that was it and and we have learned by making mistakes my first publication which is there in as part of cochrane on kmc i did my power calculation after everything and 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 that was you know because we didn't know about all these things in great detail similarly simple things like i i can tell you about uh you know um, yes we need to get trained but it could be simple things like one of the studies which an undergrad did with me was looking at how many times a newborn baby gets a, pay, a painful prick in the nicu just standing there and observing it got published in a pubmed index journal not a very big thing but it get, got him that inspiration that he went on to do more studies the sts um, icmr study and then he became a road scholar and now he is in uh, uh, in harvard and he is doing large studies across the globe so therefore i think these small things are more inspirational than ground breaking it it is ground breaking for you but may not be for the world but that inspiration is absolutely essential as a student yeah i think i agree with the real world uh, experience uh, data we used to call it as me to research what do you mean by me to research me to means we have already seen this data happening you know this published from other countries but is it true for my population the concept is same but i am trying to do it again just the difference is my population and observing it so we usually call it me to but remember for example in my career i think most of my research is me to research in trying to tell us that a particular drug works differently in an indian population as compared to say western so even that is simple to do and doesn't require much funding etc the second area where i get research ideas is apart from astute observations during the clinical practice etc is when i read papers on my subject area 
usually the authors in discussion men mention limitations of the study. There is a separate paragraph on limitations of the study. You go to that limitations and you design a study eliminating those limitations. So a new concept comes in where you try to address the same question that those guys have addressed, but they are not sure about their outcome estimate because of the limitations that they describe in their discussion. We try to eliminate that limitations in a new design and try to answer the same question more precisely. So that is another area where I try to, and many of these papers also say further research is needed on this aspect. So we said, okay, we are there to do further research on this. So you can get ideas from there as well. The third and most important is once you get published or even present a paper, it will be automatic. You'll start getting inspired and interested in this. Uh, don't get dejected, I already uh, told you. And we don't want to dissuade you because we are trying to build, bring in more structural aspects into the discussion, etc. But if you want to really, in a busy clinical practice, uh, I would like to ask any of you guys can contribute to this is, what are the requirements, structural manpower requirements, uh, apart from, you know, simple research which we ourselves can do, but if you want to really do good, serious research, then what are the structural and... Uh, and also, I would like to ask you at the same time, how do you navigate regulatory ethical issues which are as important in conducting research? I think in clinical practice, I, Shailesh mentioned, the correct thing is the documentation. You know, whatever you do in patient, initially, if your case paper or whatever you are doing, is a good case paper involving you know, t uh, all the data that could be obtained from that particular case if it is documented. And nowadays it's easier than what you used to be able to physically write every time on a case paper, which was difficult. Now electronic systems are there, so everything can be documented. And then from there on, uh, you can ask a number of questions later on as it develops and then go for clinical research. So I think that's one of the uh, simplest ways that one, so that you don't require a huge separate research structure and all to start with. You know. Of course, as your uh, numbers increase, you do require all those things, but at least to start with a good documentation and asking questions out of that documentation. The one study that you know we came up with, we realized that you know our especially gynecologists and obstetricians were too busy to you know, do uh, document anything. So we came out with a registry called as a National Eclampsia Registry. I, I, I don't know how many of you are you know, knowing about the eclampsia is the condition when the blood pressure increases during pregnancy, especially in later uh, weeks and months, and the patient convulses. And the patient, when the patient convulses, it becomes a very serious matter for the baby and the mother also, and there is a huge uh, mortality. And in our country, as it is the maternal uh, you know, mortality used to be huge, and on top of that, you know, these eclampsia cases were maximum as compared to, means whatever the whole of Europe will see, probably a city of Pune will see, you know, in, in that particular month. That much of a discrepancy is there. So we told all the doctors, okay, at least that much you can document that my patient converts and she had eclampsia and give us a few details about that patient, what, you know, whatever you have written on the paper and that became a, what is called as a national eclampsia registry and we realized that we had 10% of our, you know, women who were delivering and, you know, remember we delivered 26 million women every year. So 10% of that were getting, you know, the pre-eclampsia and 1% were getting eclampsia and that's where our you know, huge uh, you know, maternal mortality was coming out of, you know. Then we looked at ki, what is the st you know, standard practice that people are doing. And believe me, there is a drug which is called as magnesium sulfate that is life-saving in this situation of, you know, uh, eclampsia. And then we, we looked at the availability of this magnesium sulfate, you know, across our peripheral, you know, places, 
center, you know, uh, these uh, public health centers, sub-centers and all that. It was hardly available. Then we looked at ki why it is not available. The funniest thing was, you know, because this drug is one of the cheapest drugs. You know, and because the companies don't make any profit out of it at all, you know, because it hardly costs three, four rupees, so out of that, what profit they're going to make. That's why they were not, you know, making, you know, none of the big companies were making this drug. You know, and so it was not available. So on one side, we approached the, our health authorities, you know, at that time, the government, and on the other end, I approached a couple of companies that at least as your, you know, CSR or your goodwill gesture, prepare these drugs. Couple of companies agreed, and the government agreed to, you know, take this up, and the magnesium sulfate was made available, and that has made a huge difference in last 10 years in reducing our maternal mortality. Now our maternal mortality compared to many other countries in Asia and, you know, uh, Africa, we have improved tremendously and this was one of the reasons why, you know, uh, this happened. So again, a simple solution, simple documentation can come out with a lot of results. You know, so just look at things a little differently and there's something interesting will come out of whatever you're doing. I think coming to your uh, question about navigating a project, uh, when you plan a project, I think it's a good habit to follow guidelines of uh, uh, different societies. Uh, keep the ethical committee in the picture because consent, some legal issues like uh, misconduct, then uh, incentive and uh, maintaining the privacy of the patient. These are very important. So I think uh, ethical issues and uh, guidelines do play a major role when you plan a project. You asked a very relevant question and that is very, very important because 80% of the doctors are in private practice, 20% are in the teaching profession. How do you document? So documentation is not the only answer. How you document is more important. So when you document something, you should document with an idea that five years down the line, if I have to look at this, what should be the thing that I look at? And therefore, that has to be entered. A simple thing. for a, Suppose for a breast cancer, what is the location of the tumor? If you do not write about the location of the tumor, the size of the tumor, correlation, even if you ask questions five years back, what were the location, how many patients were there with the right quadrant lump, we won't be able to say. So as... You know, you have to make into a practice to write the correct things. And this is where I always quote uh, Shiv Kera that, you know, the, the, the proverb that practice makes you perfect is not correct. Practice makes you perfect in doing what you are doing, whether right or wrong correct. So if you are doing the wrong things every day correctly, then you will become so good in doing wrong things correctly that you will continue to do wrong things. And second most important thing for all of you that we are sitting here and you may be feeling we are discussing very different uh, hi-fi some things, it is not like this. we are simple human beings. So again, Shukara's quote, that great people don't do different things, they just do the same things differently. That's all. And that's what you are doing. We are not doing anything different. We are not looking up and getting up on one side of the bed and say, I am dreaming to become the number one surgeon of India. It doesn't happen that way. Never happens. You just keep on doing your work. Success should be your follower. Never in front of you. Don't run after it. It will never happen. So it will come when you document, present, do the same things. Just the difference between a lazy man and a good man is you do it anyway. I have to get up tomorrow, go and operate. Sometimes I feel very, very bad to go and operate, but that's my job. I take it sincerely, which is where Indians fail. Do your job, whatever job you do, try to achieve excellence in that and automatically the results will follow. So documentation is a very, very important aspect. Even I operate 10 cases a day, that cannot be my excuse for documenting wrong things in the literature. Documentation and one more most important infrastructural thing, Sanjay, I will tell you, no institute can write papers if you don't have postgraduates. And it's very important aspect of it. If you don't have postgraduates, if you're not into teaching, because only the postgraduates will ask you some awkward questions. Why are you doing it this way? And this will make you think, because otherwise, if there are no postgraduates and it's only your admirers in the theater and in the operation theater and they keep on saying, wow, you are doing great surgery, you feel as if you're the king of the world. 
there should be some people who should be dissenting with you every single day and questioning why this is done in a particular way we have given human minds you should question even your boss um yeah i, I think that is absolutely uh, important and i find the same with undergrads when we get undergrads into research they really make you young because they ask such questions such basic things we haven't thought about it and um, it, it is it is good to have young blood in research now in who in our a newborn research team we have a team so you don't really the infrastructure is there you have a biostatistician you have implementers you have the data team but when you are doing research with your post graduate and you then you are only two of you all so it is important even in a say a medical school or wherever you want to do your research to have your team and like minded people and the best thing is to document everything you do and ask any question like all of us as clinicians were always saying for example a central line why is the central line coming out in 4 days that's a problem we face and that itself could be a research question go back and check what are the factors which have made these things so ask the post graduate to do everything in a research mode and document and have a mind to look at things in a very uh, uh, systematic manner that itself is going to be research and uh, as far as the regulatory bodies the first body that we need to overcome is our institutional ethic ethical review board and uh, ours is one of the strongest boards in the sense that we for us if we clear our uh, erc then i think everything else will fall into place so and these things keep changing the form that i used 2 months ago will be very different from the form that i used today so please understand those things and and invariably as a student you are rushing in a 15th hours is 15th of the month they will come to you for sign on 15th morning so please plan ahead know what is needed and plan your uh, uh, protocol and all accordingly and one dictum i use for myself and all the research i do is i never embark on a research in which i would not enroll my baby i mean i say baby because i am a neonatologist because that is what i think therefore i never have a problem with the rc because once you are sure you can defend your research because you are ready to be a participant then i think there is no problem with rc the problems we face is rcts because now they ask for insurance particularly where there is a problem before in my time when we did the rct there was no insurance but and particularly for a newborn there are no insurance companies to give insurance for research because everything is calculated as life years and for a newborn that's a huge one so we had a lot of challenge in getting insurance for research in newborns but as a group we have collaborated and try try to get this again there are a lot of issues as far as say is dcgi approval required for this new innovation nobody is clear and you write to them you not get a reply for months so again my rule is if you are in doubt get it because if five years down the lane rules may change and say why didn't you get it so if you think you need a ctri approval but you're not sure go ahead and get it it takes time but i think it's worthwhile doing it right then rather than when at the time of publication oh why don't you have a ctri approval so those are some of the things that i follow to ensure that we have a smooth uh, run as far as the research and publication is concerned thank you uh, sanjay one more thing that we are talking about doing things differently as you mentioned and you have, probably many of you have heard of a person dr atul gawande you know he is supposed to be one of the great minds in today's world regarding in you know health um, uh, issues everywhere and is very well respected world over and he has written a book called a checklist manifesto and that that book is very very important for all of us elker workers we are fortunate to work with him in his in you know, initial studies and how it came out you know the concept that came out was that they studied the icu situations and in icus there used to be a lot of uh, deaths because of infections and that's why in israel you know the one person thought ki let me study why the infections are there and then he realized that in an icu almost daily on one patient there are as many as 
you know, 60, 70 procedures are being done, small, you know, injections being given, some drugs being injected, some, you know, catheters to be passed and all that. And every time, you know, this was going on, but then they realized that if this is done, every time with washing of hands by the persons who are doing it, and they made it compulsory, and they realized they could reduce the infection rate by 11 to 20 percent, and they reduced the mortality by 11 to 12 percent. And that was the first checklist that came in, ki, okay, when you do any of these procedures, you should be, you know, washing hands and doing it. And so on and so forth. Now there is a pre-surgical checklist that before doing any surgery, you know, these are the things that you have to check that you have got everything ready, you have done properly and then go ahead with the uh, surgery. And there are many, many checklists and these checklists have helped. And the, these checklists, you know, that book whole thing has been based on because the airlines have the checklist. You know, the pilots, when they get into the cockpit and you know, uh, they're about to fly, they're supposed to check many things in that cockpit and not only check but tick off ki, oh, this is checked, this is done, this is checked and then only they fly and there is important because they don't do the checklist not only the passengers but they are likely to die and that's why they are very serious about this checklist and so you know th that if we start in and we have started in medical field and that has made a huge difference in reducing mistakes and you know uh, morbidity and mortality in this so simple actions can go a long way way if we do them in a right way so again as shailesh said and also as sanjay said look at things differently they may be the same but look at them a little differently and you'll find something interesting to be done i just want to add uh about the ethics aspect is that now if we decide that we are going to routinely collect data and do analysis and publish me to research, we still need consent of the patients for using their data for analyzing for our research. Now this is very difficult because what we then came up with an idea in our clinic now over the last whenever since 15, 20 years now. Any patient who registers first time to the clinic, we give an informed consent form, which tells you that we are providing you this, this is care. This, this, this data will be collected routinely as part of your clinical care. And you are consenting to give uh, permission for us to use your data for any kind of research analysis. So we don't need to go for every project to the informed ethics committee, uh, independent ethics committee. We just have a blanket consent at registration. So this is something if you are collaborating with other clinicians, etc., you may uh, suggest to them that this is an easy way to do Me Too research without getting entangled. And this is standard in our publications, our ethical statement section says that we provided informed consent, all patients provided at the time of registration. And there has not been a rejection or an objection to this from any of the journals. Another question before we perhaps should open it out for the young people to ask you questions is who funds your research? I fund my research myself. <laughs> Same here. Simple. You know, so in our I, country, if you have to do honest research, you know you have to fund your own yeah, research. Yeah, so I was just before we were having a cup of tea. And I was just telling Sanjay the same thing in surgical branch. I'm not talking about medical branch because medical branch, whatever research you publish, finally it is monetizing the research. Meaning any research that you do is based on the money that you will earn out of that. In surgical practice, anything that you knew, uh, try to do new, they say first show us the results and then we'll fund you. So it's a different thing. Nobody funds any new surgery. Nobody nourishes a new idea in surgery. And therefore, funding is a big thing. But talking about this, I'm not giving you in a negative way. If you really believe that what you're doing is correct, which is what we did with the uterine transplant, when we did the transplant of a mother into the daughter and she delivered a child through the uterus of her mother, nobody ever thought that this can be done in Asia and especially in India. So we did India's and Asia's first transplant with the first baby. And we spent more than two crores from our project. For last four years, nobody bothered to look at it. But now, 
enough people are joining in and uh, getting with this. So if funding is important, but funding cannot come in the way of your dream, and that is the dream that if you have, that if you really believe that you are going to do it correctly, just go ahead and fund it from yourself. But unfortunately, Sanjay, we are always the last people in surgical branch to get any kind of funding, and that is the worst part. So it's the reason that we don't produce enough surgical papers. I mean, you're all medical guys, but me and Gupte sir, we really lament that if I have an idea, nobody is going to jump at it and nobody is going to give me money to do this idea. So it's a difficult task for us. As far as funding is concerned, the initial PG theses and all have to be sort of self-funded. And that becomes difficult to do very good research, interventional research with that. In medical schools now, they are keeping some funds for, like for example, in Johns, we have a research society and we get something around $80,000 faculty once in four years to do some good research. So there is some funds. Even as a student, you have this uh, short uh, student uh, scholarships from ICMR, which you get around 10,000. Not that it covers anything, but it's good to say I did a funded research. So I would encourage students to look at these options. And even in medical journals and all, you'll say best research, you know, you can get some funding. What we have done is when, when you apply, and then there is a lot of grants for large research projects. It keeps coming. We need to keep a watch out for that. The first 10 things that you write, your grant will get rejected. But please be at it. And then finally, you will get, you'll get a good funding. When you get good money from it, we sort of keep it aside so that we can fund the small research projects of our students. Similarly, you do a large conference and you generate money. We keep something aside. We have a Bangdoor neonatal trust from one neonatal conference. Not much, but 10,000, 25,000 for small studies. Uh, so funding is, in fact, now in medical school, they're asking us, how many grants have you got? So even for teachers, now it's become important to say, I have got this uh, grant. And we have to be at it to, uh, to get it. And there are a lot of options we can, we can explore. Um, but it would be good to get funding. Yeah, I would agree with the funding opportunities from the medical field. I know it's quite challenging for the surgical field. But it's always incremental. First, when you go for writing a proposal, they will ask you a list of publications. If you don't have a list of publications, the chances that you may get funded is less. So first few research, perhaps you have to maybe use your own money or try to collect, do crowdfunding, friend funding or whatever. And this is what we did. And then subsequently, once you have publications that basically builds up your uh, proposal, there is a lot of opportunities, a lot of funding opportunities. If you have a good idea and if you are able to write a good proposal, you may be able to get funding. Uh, if you are able to develop internationally, if you go to a conference and you find some international collaborator, then you can always do an international collaborative research with the caveat that the money which comes in will be in dollars or whatever currency. We need to get an HMSC screening, the Health Ministry Screening Committee of the ICMR will screen whether there is a need to get this money. Why can't you do? I mean, it's very amazing because we go through these HMSCs. Why do you need that money to do this research? Why don't you do by yourself? So, you know, it's challenging, but again, the same thing, Shaila, is persevere. You keep on hitting and try to get uh, the funding. Okay, so we will try to open up for... Just, just one more yeah. addition about the funding. There are also a lot of international collaborators who are looking at easy patient load to do research. And I'm extremely wary of it. Even if you get funding from outside, you have to be in the driver's seat as far as the methodology is concerned because so many things come and some of them are crap. They just want your patience and the data. And you need to look at all these things in great detail, whether you have control over the methods, whether it matches your ideology and your and it, the ethical aspects of it. And finally, who has control over the data? So funding, please ensure you get from the right source. 
Okay, so uh, we are open for uh, questions. It's the last half an hour, but uh, before we get some questions, I would like to ask each one of you: Is that do you think your experience with doing research, uh, as well as understanding research, has it made a difference in the way you practice? Other way round. I would say definitely so, because you know, uh, whenever you are you know, looking at any clinical problem, and if you have a research mind, you have done something, you tend to look at it definitely differently. You try and always you try to go into the you know root cause of it, see if you can make some difference by whatever you are doing. And as I said, finally that finally I decided to get into genetics was this that finally it boiled down to that oh this is going to be something which is which may give me final you know, uh, result as far as the cause is concerned. And this is the, going to be the research of the future. In five years' time, everything, all our answers, all our diagnosis, all our, many of our treatments recently, you, yesterday you heard Anderson uh, University, this thing, that even, you know, uh, uh, cancers also can be treated maybe without surgery if we properly genetically are able to diagnose and decide what that patient is going to require. And even the gene therapies are now coming in. So this is going to be the future of medicine. And that's why, you know, so if you start looking at things, you start looking at it differently. And you have to have some vision also. You develop that vision as you are practicing and you're doing your research. So that's important. I think it has made tremendous difference to me in my practice. Uh, take any field of medicine. To give an example, if I talk about pediatrics, calcifications, calcium deposits in the testes in diabetic babies, type 1 diabetes. It's a very rare entity. Whole international uh, literature, if you go through, the incidence is 0.51%. We did a major... Uh, research project on type 1 diabetes, we funded 400 children. Our incidence was 16%. Now, what, the, what was presumed that when you have this sort of calcification or calcium deposits in the testes, the chances of having cancer are very high. I mean, last 40 years, I must have seen hardly one case, but I must have seen hundreds of this calcification. And so many times, because I was doing this research project, I could see in these children, but otherwise also patients who come for any other problem, these are so common. So the, it's a different population. And I think the interpretation of the pathology is population based. That is my concept. It has also changed my outlook towards looking at the babies in the womb. It's fine. There are uh, percentiles and the protocols given. Yeah. I, stick to the protocols and stick to the guidelines, but sometimes I have to go out of the classroom, out of the text, and apply my own experience, which I derived from uh, the research activities. And especially when it comes to the baby's growth, I many times just don't rely on the textbooks. And it has worked out well. Of course, it needs uh, to be published. And now gradually the concepts are changing. All these days, all these years. Now India is, the, is labeled as the capital of diabetes, capital of the world. Simple thing, there is an entity called Pregnancy and Diabetes, GDM. That entity in next 10 years will vanish. And this is what the research uh, says. And that research comes from our department in KM Hospital. We are very proud of one of the entities the, which world has accepted thin, fat Indian baby. Means the babies are small. Average weight of a Western baby is around 4,000 grams, 4 kg. As our babies are in the range 2,700 to uh, 3,000 grams. Babies are thin. But the, why they are fat? Because our babies have more percentage of subcutaneous and visceral fat as compared to the Western babies. And that this is how our babies differ. I mean, initially, the papers were rejected, but now this is an accepted uh, entity in the world literature. So we are quite proud of it. 
I think, Sanjay, the biggest thing that has happened because of research in my practice is I have become uh, very, very knowledgeable about the subject that I pursue. Because when I do to try to do the research, I to try to go through all the papers which are there in the literature. That keeps me completely updated. I don't have to be updated by the conferences. I don't have to be updated by the medical representatives. I remain updated with my own knowledge. And then over the period of years, you don't suddenly realize that your knowledge has grown so much because you have studied this, that one fine day you're considered as the biggest expert in that field, the same field where I used to look at a white guy looking and teaching me. Today, they look at us, try to teach. And that is what has been my motto. Because as a surgeon, Sushruta was the first surgeon of the country. We lost it over a period of years to these white guys. And we always believe the books. We always believe what white is saying and white is always right. We wanted to change these perceptions. And with this idea, if I come keep on, because of my research, I became particularly expert in that field that I wanted to do. So research is not about only publishing. Research is about increasing your knowledge to yourself so that every five years you grow. You have to look at it at a corporate way. In 2022, I am here. What would be me in 2027? Can I be a better surgeon? Can I be understanding the disease better? Can I do it in a better way? Am I doing it right? So if you don't plan this, 90% of the doctors here, we do it day-to-day -day practice. We don't plan our practice. And that's what has helped me. So research is very, very important, critical, and it's almost a part of my life. If I don't write something in a month, I feel disgusted. Whether it brings me patience or no, is not a problem for me. Because in India, writing papers doesn't add any additional patient to you. It is for my personal satisfaction. You drink a glass of whiskey because it gives you pleasure. It's the same pleasure that I get. So it's like this. Yeah. Like you said, research is intoxicating. We hear that research is addictive. Yes, research is addictive and research makes a difference. For me, I would say it has made three big differences in my life. One is as a teacher and as a clinician, it sh shows you that there is so much more to learn. It is search, research, you know, otherwise it used to be a time, the professor said it, you have to listen to it. That no longer holds good. Even as a professor, I invite people to dissent with me and that definitely improves care for your patient. Every problem that we look at in our ICU, we look at it with a research mind. We practice evidence-based medicine because, as you said, you're reading left, right, and center to write your papers. And we teach this also to our students. And therefore, there is a culture of evidence-based practice and looking at a simple problem in a very systematic manner. Similarly, in life, even a simple thing is, why is my daughter not listening to me? You're looking at it with the research mind. What were all the factors which happened to it? And then how can we apply to it? So I think research is not only about your clinical care, but you can apply the same principles to your life practices too. And it brings about a very positive change. I won't see a vicious cycle. It is a very good way of you do research, you improve your clinical practice, your clinical practice improves your research and the cycle goes on. I just want to add lastly before they take questions, I think the uh, success of me going into research is related to three C's. As doctors, we are very compassionate. Everybody of us, in fact, are human. We are courageous when we treat patients and operate on the patients. But I think what if you want to have something better than anybody, you need a little bit of craziness. So there are three C's of success. Compassionate, courage, and craziness. I think we have it in plenty. So I was keen to ask you this question, is whether you like Indian whiskey or whiskey made by whites? <laughs> Because you seem to hate whites too much. <laughs> but I'm sure you drink their whiskey. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's wonderful to listen to this. And particularly the reverse um, benefit of being a researcher. Because I think patient clinical outcomes dramatically differ if you have a research bent of mind. And uh, for me, I practice evidence-based, I try to practice evidence-based medicine. For me, it's very easy because evidence, knowledge, I don't really need to read as much 
because there is a software available now called up to date which basically at the bedside gives you the latest information on patient management etc so i read up to date and i'm up to date reading about it but it's not just about practicing evidence based medicine at the bedside you have an additional layer of skill required and that is analyzing so you may have the knowledge but you should be able to analyze and develop an algorithm in the medical field for diagnosing a particular condition so it's not just evidence based uh, medicine uh good evening everyone i am shruti amin from simbiosis school of biological sciences and i'm pursuing find a uh, masters in biotechnology and i'm in my final year i wanted to ask this question to uh, either of the respected doctors that are uh, here um from the perspective of a biotechnologist what i have learned in this session is that there seems to be a difference in the process of research work and even publications between medical or clinical branch and pure biological sciences so i wanted to ask this that what is your take on it and how can we connect both of these fields in the research i think the whole thing has been about the same that you know there i agree with you that so far there has been this difference and this is the difference that we now have to reduce and this is the change that we want to bring in and that's why the i think the whole idea of this conference conference itself is that because what has to happen is okay you are working in one department you are identifying a certain problem but you have to collaborate you have to have friends in other departments who have their problems and you have to talk to them and see how they solve you know you are able to solve their problems especially in when it comes to clinical practice and for biotechnology there is a huge huge field everything that clinician does you know you know or doesn't do or not able to do you are the people who can help and solve you know so so you have to be associated with clinical department always and i hope there is a you know situation where you are put in you know together with the clinical guys in the hospital and trying to find out what they are doing and how you can help so there is a huge huge scope in fact you are as i've been saying that you know biotechnology especially bioinformatics especially genet this is the field that is going to actually lead everything all the treatment you know later on you know as far as clinical medicine is also concerned so you're lucky lucky to be in that branch right now and one advice to you is uh, if you are a senior forget ego and remember in life that your juniors are your best teachers they keep on reading they keep on asking you questions and that is how you increase the knowledge of your boss in terms of uh, doing research in your field pure biological sciences or biotechnology i think i would classify scientific research into pure sciences research and non pure sciences research non pure sciences research is probability based research pure sciences research is mathematics 1 plus 1 is equal to true you don't need an experiment to prove it so it's a pure science but what is the normal blood pressure in human population is a probability there is a gaussian distribution that some people will be outside 5% so it's true for all biological sciences that it is a probability research you want to try to find out a precise estimate with a 95% confidence intervals around that to to summarize your observation so i think the research methods used will be the same uh, the designs used with will be the same to uh, really um, answer the questions if you have in your field so i don't see any difference in design uh very good evening sir and ma'am my name is radhika narang and i'm pursuing msc nutrition and dietetics from sihs department my question is very basic uh if you would like to answer uh my question is so uh, what would be the right approach to move forward for the research is it to first identify the team or the problem the method or the i would say a question for the research paper like what would be the first step to go ahead with 
For me, the, the research question is the first thing. You need to identify what is the question you want to answer, and you should ask it well. And when you do that, you will decide who will be your team, who, what will be your methods. So the first thing would be the research question. And for most of us, it comes from a clinical practice. I think your understanding your subject is more important. Once you understand the subject, then you will understand the limitations of that subject. And that's what you will question. Because a standard practice which is already existing, you may or may not question. But unless you have a knowledge of your own field, you may not even understand what question to ask. So first, increase the knowledge of your own field and get yourself completely occupied. And then you will be able to ask, well, this is what the books say, but I don't feel this is what it is there. But that is where the questions will come with knowledge, not with Google. Okay? You are in nutritional sciences, you said, right? Okay. There is a huge field again in nutritional sciences because, you know, we simple in so Maharashtra, you have heard, there is something called as a Dixit diet and there is something called as a Divekar diet. Both are entirely opposite each other, you know, they plead. But some people are happy about one and some people are happy about other. So that's the question for you there. Why some only people are benefited by a particular, you know, nutrient and the you know, others are not, or some way of, you know, um, you take your proteins, you take up your calories or whatever. So that's where your simple research can start. start. So that means every one of us has something different among, you know, in our body itself, which responds to nutrition differently. So that's a huge field there to do your research. Take up one particular, whatever substance or nutrient you like, and start working on it. Keep what, what are the effects of this in our population? Don't go by whatever Western books say. In our population, with our food, our habits, and how it acts. You know, that itself, and any of that you can take, and that itself will be your starting of the research point. You do, the, you search the literature and identify the gaps in the literature and target those gaps. Yeah, I would like to summarize by saying all this is so may important. I, may I ask one last just, question? Just let me finish this okay. comment. You may identify all these things, but the real thing which will make you a researcher is whether you have a hunger to answer those questions that you have identified. If you have that hunger, you will persevere and try to develop that. So it's basically an inside passion to answer a question that is very, very important. There are numerous ways to identify a question. But do I have the hunger? Do I have the attitude and the perseverance to answer that question? So me, uh, Dr. Samita Zadov, Dep Deputy Director of Symbiosis Institute of Health Sciences. Here we have a multidisciplinary uh, you know, crowd of students, of faculty, right from medical, nursing, uh, even MBA students, uh, nutrition students, biotechnology, medical technology. So we have a multidisciplinary, uh, you know, uh, the, the students are from various domains. Now, Dr. Shailesh uh, also mentioned, most of you also mentioned that funding is very, uh, you know, difficult right at the uh, beginning and even uh, for pure uh, surgery. But uh, because of the new education policy, you know, we are talking about multidisciplinary education. Can't we have a collaboration in, uh, you know, the various domains? And uh, how is your experience to this collaborative multidisciplinary kind of research? So if you could just comment. I think, uh, Samita, that is a very good question. And that is one of the biggest reasons why such kind of conferences exist. Because I don't know what madam is doing in her field. She doesn't know what I am doing in my field. How do we collaborate? And that is the biggest problem. We have our own boundaries laid back. I don't want to attend a medical conference. A medical person doesn't want to attend a surgical conference. And that is where the things are. Engineers fear to attend inside the operation theatres. Doctors who don't want to go to engineers to start that. So multidisciplinary approach is very important. The question is, somebody, somebody has to take it up to get these things on one platform. And it is, this will be the beginning because that's where the ideas will be churned out. And these ideas, when they churn out, so sometimes a guy next door, I won't even know what Dr. Gupta is 
is doing with his genie genomes till i meet him in person and i won't make an effort to ask him and call him up so if there is a platform where we can discuss these kind of things then i come to know what is a guy doing so i think it's very important to have these kind of groups which unfortunately do not exist not only in pune but nowhere in the country and it's high time that somebody has to take it up because i'm sure something good will always come out of this i think one of the simplest thing and i think at college level that is important since you have all these you know faculties why not to put the you might have already done put the groups of them together you know somebody from nutritional science from biotech from clinical science even from hospitality together and look at the patient's problem together assign them any any case or any patient and they should look at from their point of view what they will want to do with that you know patient the hospitality person might you know look at it from whether the patient is getting good services whether the patient is you know satisfied with what's going on while you know biotechnologists will say ki oh these investigations are done but can these be done in a different manner nutritional person will say are this patient requires not only medicines but these kind of you know diets so also you know so many faculties are there and just let them work on one clinical situation together and present their views and i think they will learn from each other how to look at you know the situations differently and that itself will become a you know translational translational research um i would also like to add that uh, it would be good to collaborate with other institutes which also run uh, teaching programs and fellowships for example we collaborate a lot in bangalore with the indian institute of science and they have their and, and you we get together and say this is the problem we have how can you find a solution to it we were doing a lot of work on noise reduction in the nicu so we visited the hal the hindustan aeronautical limited we went to the cockpit of uh, you know they have a co cockpit simulator which sort of neutralizes the noise and we had a whole series of small projects that we did together so i think like you said a little craziness because i, I remember when i got into that cockpit what am i doing here was my question because i am a pure neonatologist so i uh, it is good to collaborate it is good to connect to each other and i am sure that across fields like symbiosis you are lucky that you have everything in one campus whereas we many of us are in medical colleges but it is easy and people are ready to collaborate even without funding uh funding of course comes later but collaborations are good and it is important that like minded people even within the field collaborate because to get your sample size and numbers and your issues it is always very good to do multi centric research the value of it as an output and also for publication is greater i would just add uh, that it's all nice cross specialization collaboration and everything but i think since dr vidya is also here is can we it, in this institution have 3 to 6 months dedicated research methodology research design understanding of biostatistics being taught across all specialties okay so for all specialties compulsory so then you collaborate <laughs> can i ask a question uh, uh, i'm dr ramakrishnan from uh, the department of ent um, this is primarily a surgical question because i am also a surgeon and uh, we surgeons have a habit of saying you know this is the way i do it and i have uh, great outcomes and um, and it's it becomes established practice and now during the course of practice since we are talking about uh, translational research how it translates into clinical practice um you come across an let's so called an evidence based paper in which talks about a different surgical technique or different surgical method contrary to what a surgeon is practicing should you adopt it uh, because that evidence shows the outcomes were better than yours will you adopt uh, that new surgical methodology or would you be contented with the fact that your uh, Uh, surgical technique is adequately good and resulting in good outcomes i think 
think that is an excellent question because to get yourself to change after a particular age that is very difficult it's absolutely me you can say theoretically oh well i'll change with the new evidence based uh, surgical technique every time so that doesn't happen what i personally believe is if you are doing a particular technique can your resident duplicate the technique and get the best results and that is the most crucial question you have to ask yourself anything that you do should be able to be duplicated and here i give an analog to all my residents mcdonalds has become famous because they made the same size burgers same taste worldwide can your surgical steps be duplicated by 10 people if it can be duplicated then your surgery is good enough if you cannot duplicate and you cannot get your residents to duplicate your steps and you say dr ramkrishnan is the best surgeon i do the surgery and i this is the best way i can do it you die your steps will die so don't do this always try to analyze your steps whether they can be duplicated and that's the basic reason when i said that the backbone of every institute is post graduates if you don't have the young blood with you they will you will not progress because they will question you you would like to teach them in a particular way and if that cannot be duplicated so always i don't think i change with every new technique that is been developed but i just find out whether the technique which is written can be duplicated by me if it can be duplicated it is here to stay and that is my basic motto and it should be always related sir to anatomy so if your anatomical knowledge is good you can do everything but not every paper makes me change the technique good evening sir uh, my uh, myself dr sachin i am professor in community medicine uh, i want to know your opinion and uh, message for all considering the novel ideas in research like uh, what is your opinion about use of technology for technology we have seen that nowadays the life everything has changed the way we are bringing up the children especially it has changed and how if it, it is affecting so should not we move on to this era use of digitization technology for technology the technological use which is been like what the life was earlier and what the life is after the introduction like mobile phones laptops and their impacts on the children etc so uh, like we have the national digital health mission also coming plus we also have the use of uh, different softwares use for research so how is it impacting the health of the people and how we can uh, come out with measures to reduce that ill effects yeah that's that's a good question the thing is i think we are looking at things a little wrongly it's not the technology which is at fault it is the way we use it it is you know the the things are wrong in fact the same technology can be used in a much better way to improve things you know so if you are talking about children you know uh, using screens and all that through the same screen if you are able to teach them what are the good things about it and bad things about it i think they will learn faster we are trying to you know use not use the technology to teach them that technology is bad you know so uh, that's where the things are wrong we can use technology in much better way to improve the use of technology even in children and we have been using and the technology has been improving and i don't think world has really worsened it is all you know always improved from years together from what our time is and what your time is so why should we be worried about technology use it in a better way that is what we have to learn we should not you know be scared or worried about technology we should try and learn it you know teach it learn it use it better yeah so let's uh, conclude uh, maybe by just each one of you last summary two sentences each as an inspiration to our participants here only two sentences please that is called as an abstract um research is a culture it is a way of life that we need to embrace which will definitely improve our clinical practice and also our life research is not something astronomical difficult whatever you are doing in daily life 
just look at it differently and that becomes a research. So don't get worried or scared with it. Go ahead and just start looking at things differently you will, and you will be in the research. I think uh, we said this during my entire talk. Document whatever you do, crazily, rightly, badly, poorly, whatever. Document it. Five years down the line when you look at it, you will see, you will change your attitude because things may be right, may be wrong. Unless you have a documented proof of what you are doing, nothing will change. So research is not something as a, a word which is different. Just document it, you will fairly get your ideas. If you don't document, you don't remember four years back what you have done and that's a very critical part of your life. Sentence number one. <laughs> Quality control is the most important part of research. Sentence number two. The result should be implemented in practice. What a magnificent session that was. We are grateful to the guests for enlightening us and providing us with an infinite wealth of useful information. We are humbled by your presence. On behalf of everyone here today, we thank you for taking your valuable time in addressing our delegates.